everybody to today's City Forum. Um, and it's my uh, great pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Austin City Council Member Greg Kassar. Um, Council Member Kassar represents District 4 in Austin, which is sort of north northwest, very diverse district socioeconomically, diverse in terms of housing type. I think you're a, a rental, a renter majority district, are you, Greg? Uh, yeah, probably over 70%. Yeah. And, and most recently, the, the lowest income district in the city. So, yeah, the most working class part of town. Officially. Yeah. Um, so um, Greg came to the city council with a background in uh, organizing and advocacy uh, through his work at the Workers Defense Project, which is a somewhat unusual trajectory uh, to uh, end up on the city council. But it's great. Um, you know, I think the title of today's talk, uh, Austin moving from an exclusive to an inclusive city, uh, really describes the overriding challenge that Greg, other city political leaders, and for that matter, Austin city residents are facing. Um, and in this regard, uh, Council Member Kassar has succeeded in advancing uh, very important policies on a number of fronts. I'll name just a few, I could go on and on. Um, he led efforts to pass the largest affordable housing bond uh, in Texas history for all the cities in Texas. And this allows the city to directly invest to expand the, the supply of decent affordable housing. Um, he um, worked with low-income residents to fight evictions, including um, um, evictions and, and kind of uh, turning over ownership to residents of um, manufactured housing uh, developments in the city. He spearheaded a, a paid sick leave uh, provision in Austin, which spread to other uh, Texas cities. And he authored, uh, he was the author of the Texas Freedom City policies, which reduced discretionary misdemeanor charges, which you know obviously come down um, more on low income people and people of color. And he sort of remodeled public safety in Austin uh, coming out of this past summer um, to move funds from policing uh, to other services to really you know, advance public safety. Oh, I could go on and on, but I'm gonna turn it over uh, now to Council Member Kassar. Hi y'all, thank you for the uh, kind introduction, Dr. Odin. It's good to see uh, a, lot of, a lot of friends and people I've gotten a chance to work with um, recently and over the years here as part of the as part of the forum um, so you know the, of course we can go on and on about the the struggles that we've faced in Austin certainly pre-pandemic and that have been exacerbated um, during the pandemic um, and and I don't want to get too deeply into all of those I mean we, we, we know about it right um, increasing unaffordability of the city increasing uh, GDP and and growth uh, but stagnating wages um, and and then the continued um, exclusive uh, you know increasingly exclusive nature of the city in terms both of of political power economic power and other forms of of, of inclusion and so or exclusion but instead of harping too long about all of the bad stuff um, I, I want to talk about ways that this community has come together to um, to become more inclusive uh, maybe as a as a model sometimes of the incrementally good things that we've been, been able to to do these last few years not and not with a focus on on what I have sponsored or written or done but the things I've been proud to be a part of um, because I do think fundamentally that um, that you know this the solutions have to come from us ourselves that it's way harder to do without as much state and federal support as it is that we need um, and of course, there are tons of campaigns and conversations related to state and federal government, but that here locally in Austin, there is a, a, a real drive and desire amongst everyday people um, to become a more inclusive city. People love Austin, um, but they want to see that, that change. And I've seen that people really can do that. Um, and so I'm going to uh, talk just a little bit on each kind of the topics that Dr. Oden already mentioned. Uh, one, uh, housing, because you can't be an inclusive city if you push people out and you can't have them participate in lots of ways if they can't even live here. Uh, so talking about inclusion, the steps we've taken to try to be more inclusive in our housing and planning. Uh, second, 
on public transit uh, and, and non stuck in your car on your own uh, in traffic transportation, just because how can you be inclusive if people can't get around or see each other or, or participate, you know, not have access and participate in that way. So what we're trying to do there and what's being worked on. Uh, third, um, on trying to undo mass incarceration uh, because that is just um, uh, a part of our continued legacy and challenge of how are we actually solving problems rather than, um, rather than just putting people away in jail or in detention centers uh, for immigrant communities, obviously separating families and deporting them is, is the antithesis of, of inclusion apart from being horrible in lots of other ways. Uh, and then last, um, sort of inclusion in political power and in civic engagement because people uh, should be able to, you know, our, our one thing that maybe doesn't get talked about as much is that while Austin's local politics does have tons of participation, whenever I talk to uh, my colleagues and peers in other cities, um, they are just amazed at how many people participate and listen to uh, uh, what's going on in Austin politics, which is a great thing, but it is so skewed, oftentimes so skewed away from um, working class folks, uh, immigrants and folks of color actually uh, having a seat at the table that even in the cases where the interests of excluded people um, are, are at the center, oftentimes the, the voices of those folks are not as organized or as invested in or at the table. And so inclusion in that power and decision-making process and what that looks like and how we're headed there um, is another part of what, I, of what I wanna talk about. So I hope that, so I'm gonna go kind of run through each of those topics. Uh, I'm gonna try to keep it short so that you guys can really ask me what you wanna ask me and we can talk about more whatever it is that interests you. Uh, so on the first, on the topic of housing, which has kind of, I think, been probably one of the most front and center issues at City Hall. Um, we actually have a, uh, a, we have laid out what it would look like for us to be a less exclusive city on housing by a little bit, uh, because it, with current economic trends, we're going to continue to see uh, more and more folks get displaced and pushed out of the city um, unless we really, really prioritize the issue and transform housing politics in the city. And so we actually passed uh, a comprehensive plan that's, that is called our strategic housing blueprint uh, that shows how much more housing we need in the city and how much of it we need actually restricted to lower income and working class individuals for us to not continue to lose the economic and racial diversity that we, that we have in the city. And so I'm going to try to share my screen. So what, and if we'll see if it works. Oh, here's the button. And um, let me see if I can click this really quick. And it should hopefully work. Let's see. All right, I think you guys can see this. Y'all give me a thumbs up. So this is um, the housing need in the next 10 years. Um, uh, this is if we want to uh, maintain the economic diversity and racial diversity that we have right now in the city, um, we need well over 100,000 more housing units built. Um, because as we have a, more and more people born here, more and more people graduating from school here, uh, and people moving here, if I describe it as, you know, if we have a pitcher that is three quarters of the way full, and we are pouring another half pitcher of water, then people will inevitably be pushed out uh, just by simple uh, lack of supply of housing. So we need more housing built. But then we also need that housing to be at a variety of price points um, so that we don't, um, you know, so that not all of the housing is expensive because then otherwise you're not fixing the, the core problem. So we, there are a few, you know, key ways for us to address the issue. Uh, one of them is to legalize um, uh, more housing being built and for more of it to be at the, in the not just big McMansion replacing little house scenario, um, but actually that you're getting more of a, you know, small apartments or a duplex with a, a smaller duplex in the back or the kind of, the kind of housing that uh, is not just one big house sitting on one big lot that is brand new. Uh, that, you know, can provide some of the more middle class housing that we're missing in the city. But we can't expect that low income housing is going to get built in the city just all on its own without uh, government intervention. And that requires uh, a real subsidy 
uh, and other and other forms of incentives and things for us to to get that kind of housing. We're banned in Texas from just doing like rent control or for, or from what's called inclusionary zoning, where where we tell a builder, hey, if you're going to build this, it requires X amount period to be low income, and so we have to use a variety of tools to get to this goal. The big challenges that we face are uh, one, a lot of our city is already built out, and so it's it's pretty tricky to figure out where new housing will go, and there's a lot of politics associated with that. Two, we have pretty old and restrictive rules that tend to favor um, either a really, really big apartment building being built where a currently smaller and more affordable one is, or a big single family McMansion getting built where one existing little single family house is. And so, um, and that actually leads to, to, of course, cheaper housing being oftentimes uh, uh, replaced by more expensive housing. And it restricts the overall number of units that are getting built in the city because you're not adding in the smaller infill housing types that you want, and you're not getting those smaller apartment buildings mixed into the city. On our current trajectory, we actually, um, given all the legal constraints that exist in the city's existing zoning code, we do not think that it is legally or economically possible to build the number of housing units required in the next 10 years that are on this chart. So we have to kind of redo the entire uh, zoning code to try to achieve this sort of goal. Uh, and, and it's been pretty politically fraught. And I'm sure you guys might have questions to ask about that, but it's been uh, like a seven year long process. Apart from the zoning code and legal restrictions parts, there is real subsidy that needs to be brought to the table. Billions of dollars um, necessary to actually bring down uh, housing prices to produce the level of low income housing that we need in the city. Prior to 2018, the city had gone to election for uh, housing bonds uh, a few times, uh, four different times, and had failed two of the times. So 50% of the time voters turned down the money necessary to subsidize the low income housing that we needed. Most of the time that those packages were 20 or, or 70 or $80 million, uh, you know, just drop tiny drops in the bucket of the billions of dollars in need uh, where we are now. You might ask, why is it that we have to go to voters? Uh, the answer is that generally the city can take out debt um, without going to voters for, you know, big for some kinds of big infrastructure projects, fixing streets, um, uh, building a fire station, you can just go ahead and do that. But for things like public transit or low income housing, there are state rules that pretty much say you have to go to the voters and pass an election. And so coming up to 2018, what the uh, community really pushed city council on was, let's go for a $250 million ask. Let's do multiple times bigger than we've ever done before, because that might actually inspire folks to vote, to get behind a campaign, if it's actually gonna help tens of thousands of people uh, get housing and not be pushed out of the city. Um, and we recognize that still 250 million is dwarfed by billions of dollars in need, but we could set that as the new sort of standard, that these things need to be hundreds of billions of dollars, not uh, a few dozen million dollars. There was a lot of fear that if an $80 million housing bond failed just a few years before, how are we gonna pass 250? Uh, and a big lesson that we learned in the end was that the theory was right to go bigger because we passed it with over 70% of the vote. It was also a November election um, when there were a lot of people excited. Uh, it was the same election when the Beto O'Rourke was on the ballot. Um, and so we passed it overwhelmingly, like bigger than a landslide uh, with that big inclusion, you know, with, with that big number. So again, um, part of what we have to recognize is that it's going to take a bunch of different um, strategies for us to actually get uh, to our housing goal, over 135,000 units of housing in the next 10 years. Um, and we're going to need that to, to change our laws, to change our priorities, to think bigger than what we did before, and then to bring you know, massive uh, dollars of subsidy uh, to the table. So that is, that is part of what we're trying to think about on the, on the land use and housing side. Um, uh, of, of the housing equation, but just to show you a bit of the shift over, over time in that politics from sort of doing small things on the edges now to trying to rewrite the entire housing code and bring these large subsidies to the ballot. 
the next bit is, is public transportation, which is on your ballot actually in November. Um, again, this is a place where the city has tried in the past and not pulled it off. In 2000, just by basically 1%, a light rail line was voted down that would have run down Lamar and then Guadalupe and then down uh, South Congress. Then in, 20, uh, in 2014, a different rail line planned for Airport Boulevard, sort of from where the Highland Mall was then, now the ACC Highland, uh, running down Airport um, and then into the downtown area down Red River. Both, um, that one failed by an even uh, wider margin in 2014. And so this is something that's been tried again and again to bring um, a real public transit solution uh, forward. And so this November, again, the same sort of theory of what we talked about on housing um, is being brought to the table. Instead of a, in 2014, what was sort of a plan driven more by a plan between sort of the business community and the, and the mass transit agency, Cap Metro. Instead, this time it's more of a community driven plan that actually has uh, electric buses uh, running throughout a variety of lines across the city to serve all different parts of the city. And then um, um, three rail lines. One, the green line, which would be more of a commuter line running east and northeast into the parts of, of Austin that are uh, percentage-wise heavily folks of color. Uh, then the orange line, which would be the spine of the city, uh, which is kind of that 2000 line that failed, that actually serves more low-income people than any part of the city, uh, and lots of the high-income areas in Austin running from uh, North Lamar, just north of 183, down past campus, again through downtown, and then uh, down into South Austin, down Congress. And then a blue line, uh, which would uh, also serve uh, the drag run down uh, through downtown and then kick you out east, uh, down East Riverside down to the airport. So like an actually truly comprehensive now $7 billion plan on the ballot. And the question is going to be whether this time it will, it will pass similar to what we put on the ballot with the, with the housing bond. That would, if we actually brought something fully comprehensive that would serve 300,000 people, get them to be able to move around without having to get in your car, that something that is that big ticket, which will then inevitably cost more in taxes, but that will actually um, solve the problem in a more significant way, whether that will actually um, pass or whether, um, whether it's too ambitious. And that's something we'll find out, whether the, whether the analog makes sense on the housing bond and on the public transit side. What I do wanna show you all though, is that one of my real concerns and a lot of community members' concerns is we see how these mass transit investments sometimes drive displacement um, because when you bring something that is so valuable, you know, a train going by your house every five minutes that even in traffic can get you from North Lamar uh, down to downtown in like, you know, 20 minutes without you ever having to sit in your car, um, whether that, you know, that's something that is so valuable that we can't exclude working class and lower income neighborhoods from that service. I mean, we have to include them and have to run it by those neighborhoods. At the same time, given the housing pressure that we face, uh, there is a real question of, well, are you just gonna wind up pushing those folks away and somebody that's higher income is gonna get access to that awesome uh, service? It's actually something I experience all the time on, um, in, one of my, in one part of my district that sometimes by the news is like made to seem like a, a place that is dangerous uh, for crime because there is like more crime in parts of my district than, than there are in other parts of the city. Oftentimes when I knock on folks' doors, they've said, well, you know, I know um, who the drug dealers are down the street. They don't really mess with me. But the thing that's dangerous is the crossing Lamar Boulevard or not having a light here at this intersection. So can you put the light in, um, but not tell anybody about it? Because once it's better, then, you know, are, are, is my rent going to go up? Right. I mean, these are real like tensions that we face about bringing a public service, but also not uh, worsening unaffordability. And so actually what we are doing as part of Project Connect, which is the, the mass transit election on the ballot, is, is bundling in $300 million in housing anti-displacement investments as part of the bond election so that we can actually help people uh, maintain home ownership near the transit line so that we can actually preserve affordability in the uh, low-income housing that's existing near the transit lines. Uh, and. Are, we're actually ceding a good amount of community control 
to how it is we will invest those $300 million. And as we look across the country, we can't find another city that has put more money in anti-displacement strategies as part of their transit election. And to show you just sort of um, this tension, I wanna show you some, um, some maps here. So, um, you know, as part of our partnership with the University of Texas, we actually um, um, have developed some maps of vulnerability to gentrification. And I see that I think Dr. Mueller is on and maybe some other folks uh, are here who um, helped develop some of the maps I'm gonna show you later that showed vulnerability to gentrification. Um, but first I'm gonna show you, here are the, the rail lines that are planned for the city, um, overlaid on where low income people live in Austin. And so you can see that the orange and blue lines especially really serve the places where the most low income people are in the city, which is a good thing. We, we want to make sure that not only the, the better off, more central and west neighborhoods of the city get access to transit, but also that low income parts of the city do. Um, uh, the green line, which I mentioned to you, actually serves fewer low income people, um, but those northeast parts of the green line are in census codes that are overwhelmingly folks of color, but there's just fewer people there because they're less dense parts of the city. Um, and so I think the next map shows percentage people of color. So you can see that the green line over in the northeastern part serves some zip codes that have a high percentage of folks of color, but uh, still nothing quite like um, our, the northern part of our city north of 183, that's the 787. Five three zip code on the northern part of the orange line, high percentage of folks of color, and the highest is actually out near the airport and the eastern part of that blue line. So you can see a transit plan that serves all different parts of the city, serves people um, of all uh, racial and economic backgrounds, but there's a real gentrification concern. So as part of, um, again, one of our great partnerships with UT, uh, and you know, I know there were you know, lots of students and faculty that helped with this, we developed this map that shows vulnerability to gentrification. The darker maroon is the most vulnerable and the red are the more vulnerable areas. So you can again see that the area near the airport in East Riverside, the area is just north of 183 along the orange line uh, and that green line, again, basically the places where low-income people still manage to live in the city also happen to be the areas that are most vulnerable to gentrification. Um, and so again, we're trying to think about, there was a real tension of, do you just not send the line there so that you don't have the gentrification concern? But then do you have a, a inequity in billions of dollars in this public investment not going there? And so this, the way to try to address the question was to, do, was to do both. So that's ways that we are working again on inclusion um, uh, and trying to push away, away from exclusion on the, on the mass transit front. Uh, then um, now I, just, I have two sort of topics left here before I really want to open it up to your questions. Um, uh, deportation and over-policing. So um, in, back in 2012, 2013, actually Travis County was one of the places that was deporting more people than almost any other county in the, in the country. Um, although our percentage of the Latino population is lower than say San Antonio um, down to I-35, actually our percentage of people who are undocumented here is much higher. Uh, we, we are one of the more undocumented cities in the country actually. Um, a lot of that is driven just because once you have undocumented folks, um, uh, you know, building community and a neighborhood here together, you, you bring your family members and you, and you try to uh, build, a, build a community here. And so for a long time, you know, we have actually really been a place that has a lot of undocumented people, but with the ramped up programs that were deporting people out of our jail, um, we saw how people getting pulled over and jailed for minor offenses really fueled um, a deportation, you know, a deportation crisis that we're still in uh, here in the city. And so our city did what it was, everything it was that we could uh, to slow that. One of the things was to cancel uh, the, the jail to deportation pipeline at our jail. Um, but that drew a response uh, from, from Trump and from the governor to pass a law called Senate Bill 4 that would essentially reinstate and force programs to deport people that wind up in the jail. Um, and so the, from there, it became clear that actually the goal of ending mass incarceration, reducing uh, you know, needlessly large jail populations, and the work of reducing deportation in the city 
we're ultimately tied together. Um, that, um, that what's being asked for by the movement for black lives and longtime criminal justice reform advocates and people fighting to keep immigrants in our community, it all could kind of come together around this idea of, well, why are so many people getting sent to the jail in the first place? And when we looked at, um, at a lot of data, it showed that um, a lot of people were winding up in the jail for things that they could get just a plain ticket for, driving with a suspended license, or things like um, um, having possessing a small quantity of marijuana. These are the sorts of things that thousands of people would get a ticket for, but overwhelmingly, uh, people of color and lower income people were actually getting arrested for the same thing. And when you get arrested, you go through booking. When you go through booking, your information is sent to ICE and you can be deported. And so um, we saw real stark racial disparities. Uh, Latinos being arrested, you know, at a rate several times higher for driving with a suspended license. We saw black folks in our city getting, being seven times more likely to be arrested for having a small amount of marijuana than white residents stopped for the exact same thing, even though that we know that marijuana use is, is virtually equivalent across, across racial groups. So we passed our Freedom City policies that basically said, if you can get a ticket for it, then you need to get a ticket for it. And to take away the discretion of some people being arrested and some people being ticketed for the same offense. And actually with that, we saw a 75% drop in class C arrests in our city, just by taking away the discretion and the option to arrest people for something if they could safely get a ticket for it. Um, so that has, that has reduced really significantly uh, the number of people in the jail, uh, which is really important because if, if you're documented, um, then you know, still winding up a night in jail, you could still wind up losing your job. Uh, if you're in jail, it increases the chances you're gonna wind back up in jail. Uh, and being in jail is terrible. Um, but then obviously for immigrant family members and community members that you know, could, could ultimately make sure that we aren't getting a family separated, somebody's not winding up in deportation proceedings. Um, at, we, we actually scaled that work up even further um, with, with marijuana enforcement. And, um, and because um, now marijuana needs to be run through a lab to be tested um, to prove that it's marijuana, uh, the city just decided that we're not gonna buy testing equipment to test marijuana and therefore it's ultimately now city policy that people just shouldn't get ticketed or arrested for marijuana at all because there isn't the testing equipment for it and again we've seen how that has continued to drive down those those needless low-level arrests in our city um, on the deportation side as well for some of you guys might have seen that as part of that law that i described that the governor passed called senate bill 4 it forced that continued jail to deportation pipeline um, in our city. It also required that police officers ask the, uh, be allowed to ask the question, you know, show me your papers, show me your immigration papers at a traffic stop. Um, and uh, the city of Austin led on a lawsuit um, to try to block that law. Uh, generally, we were pretty unsuccessful, but we did pull one, have like one really, really key win as part of that lawsuit uh, that I hope goes to show how it is we can use local government to be you know, creative to continue to push for, you know, racial and economic fairness and inclusion. So as part of that lawsuit, basically they reaffirmed, yes, you're, you can be forced to have a, a jail to deportation pipeline in, um, in your community. Yes, police officers under this law have to be allowed to say, show me your papers. But we updated our policing policy um, to, to sort of capture one, one win because the court did say, that um, immigrants are not required to answer uh, the question of whether they are undocumented or not. People still have their right to not, to not answer the question. Now, you could be deported if you answer the question wrong, um, but you don't have to answer the question. And so now in Austin, the policy is that police officers, if they want to say, show me your papers, they're required to say, I'm about to ask you a question. You don't have to answer this question. I'm not going to do anything to you if you don't answer the question, do you understand? And that people have to answer that in the affirmative before they can be asked to show me your papers, which has ultimately led to basically no one being asked that question in our city. So again, there are different ways that, uh, that through uh, community activism and organizing, people can push their local government, um, even in those really tense situations um, where the state and federal government might want something different. That idea 
uh, for that policing policy actually came from an immigrant worker themselves um, who passed that idea along to city leaders. And then a whole community came around that to push us to make that our policy. Um, and so again, there's just these, these, these ways that we can keep pushing ourselves to, to not settle for being a place that incarcerates people or deports people or displaces people uh, just because some other level of government might want us to. Um, and, and that kind of leads me to the last topic here, which is sort of inclusion and power and in um, decision making. Oh, actually, no, I, I skipped the, the part that maybe a bunch of you guys want me to talk about, which is also over policing and our police budgets. Uh, and so I want to share that with you here as well. Um, our city here in Austin has spent more on policing per capita than any of Texas's other big cities until this year. Um, it is uh, a standard thing in American cities that our primary government response to a challenge or a problem is policing. Um, uh, and that, and, and it just hasn't worked, right? If uh, having a, you know, more people in jail necessarily made us more safe, then I believe our country would be the safest country on earth, but we're, but we're not. Um, well, we, we recognize and see that just putting somebody in jail doesn't address a substance use challenge. Just putting somebody in jail does not address mental health or doesn't get somebody housed. And so our, our city, again, has been, a, has been part of, and just like pretty much any other major city in this country, um, sort of perpetuating over generations the, the solution of mass incarceration when you have a problem. Uh, until just a few years ago, it was a criminal offense to skip school. It was a criminal offense to be out late at night. Uh, it was a criminal offense to be a person experiencing homelessness sitting down on a corner downtown um, or, or pitching a tent under a bridge. And so, again, it's really clear that those things don't get solved. Uh, and any police officer could tell you those things don't get solved by throwing somebody in jail for a night. So the question has been, so then what do you do? Um, and and the, the goal that our city has pursued probably more aggressively than almost any other city in the country is to say, well, let's take some of the investment that we continue to put into that system and put it into other systems. And I know that has come under ma massively under fire. Um, you know, there's been kind of a press conference about how this is a bad idea almost every week since we, since we started the work, but I really believe in it. Uh, and I think that we've been really kind of trying to listen to the community and be thoughtful about how it is we do it. Um, so I'm going to share with you all um, the spreadsheet um, that, that kind of shows how Austin is trying to, to recommit its budget priorities. So the police budget in Austin uh, up until this year was about $440 million. That's about 40% of the discretionary funds available to the city. Uh, what just went to this one thing, policing. Um, and that part of the budget overwhelmingly would suck up almost any new money just because by virtue of increasing cost of living meant increased salaries is the biggest uh, departments in the city. So it would just ob it's obviously lots of times absorbed a lot of money. And so what we decided to do was to, um, was to kind of reimagine that part of the budget um, with a $150 million uh, change to the way that we do the, to the, the way that we do things, but that 150 million dollars was kind of the headline. The headline said Austin cuts 150 million out of its police budget, but that doesn't tell even close to the real story. Um, the real story is that we, re, we we immediately cut and reallocated 20 million dollars from our police budget. The way we did that was we said we're not going to hire um, new police officers this year. We've hired classes and classes of new police officers every single year for as long as anybody can remember. We're going to take one year off um, while we review that police training and make sure that it you know, lives up to our values um, so that we actually have a training, the kind of training that we'd be proud of um, that has more of that guardian mentality rather than a warrior mentality. And by um, essentially holding off on hires just one year um, and by reducing our overtime budget uh, just by a little bit, given that you're not going to have as many police officers on overtime since there's not South by Southwest, um, since everybody's so many people are at home. Um, let's let's reduce that overtime budget by a little bit and not hire new police officers. And with just that alone, you get about twenty one million dollars in savings. That money 
was reallocated to the things on the right side of this spreadsheet. Um, things like uh, EMS for COVID response, because we're running out of sometimes of ambulances to take care of COVID patients. Mental health responders, so that when you call 911, you hear, do you need police, fire, EMS, or mental health? So that we have mental health experts actually going and responding to mental health calls instead of just police officers. Violence prevention programs, um, so that you actually have people intervening um, where there's frequent gun violence and reducing that gun violence rather than just responding to gun violence, um, where you actually have people going out and interacting with and providing support to sex workers, um, because we know a lot of times that our response to sex work is just criminalization, but oftentimes it is people that are involved in things like sex work that are most frequently the, the victims or survivors of, of violence. Having um, family violence shelter is a critical way to improve public safety and reduce violence. The, one of the top contributors to violence in our city um, is interpersonal violence. And no matter how many patrol cars go by uh, a house or an apartment complex, that doesn't deter or reduce uh, violence that happens inside of the home. And we actually haven't added a single family violence shelter bed to this city in years. And so what we're doing again is um, finally opening a new family violence shelter so you can prevent that violence before it happens in the first place. Food access, uh, which we know is so badly needed in the pandemic. Abortion access, which we know, again, is so badly needed in the pandemic because we've seen um, real, it, real issues, both legal uh, and logistical, with people being able to access abortion uh, during the pandemic. Uh, family support programs, re-entry programs, because we know that we need to interrupt cycles of, of reincarceration. Um, epidemiology, uh, epidemiologists and COVID response workforce development program so that people can get um, a job coming out, uh, coming into the recovery. Um, and then uh, the kind of technology and tracking we need to have a more equitable uh, system of policing. So these are the kinds of things that we reinvested dollars into. Oh, and there's one really big one that I missed, I should have mentioned, I think is at the top, is housing people experiencing homelessness. Again, we have seen um, increased homelessness as we see increased unaffordability in the city. Uh, and our shelter capacity has actually been cut in half by the pandemic. And so we know that uh, folks experiencing homelessness are at real risk of, uh, of harm. Uh, and if we actually want to, to stop just addressing homelessness through jailing, then we, need, uh, then we need homes and services to get people back on their, on their feet. So we made this you know, really significant uh, by politics standard reallocation, but just by straight up numbers. Out of a $440 million budget, $20 million is like, you know, less than 5% um, uh, of the budget. And it didn't lay off any police officers. What it did was ultimately um, make it so that we just weren't hiring people this, this one year. So then where does the $150 million number come from? It comes because we also said we're going to decouple about $80 million of functions that are currently housed within the police department and make them independent. That is things like internal affairs where police officers currently investigate other APD officers. That doesn't make good sense, I don't think, to anyone. So we wanna decouple that function so that it's independently being done from the police department. Still happening, but independently being done. Separating our forensics lab, um, because you want scientists running your DNA lab, uh, not, uh, not the police department. Um, we've, y'all, y'all may have seen in the news that we actually had to shut down our DNA lab because of scientific failures there which worsened the rape kit backlog uh, that had needlessly accumulated over years. And so there's good reason to decouple and pull some of these functions out of the police department's control, but you would still have that going on. 911 dispatch will still happen, but wouldn't it make sense for dispatchers to run 911 so that the right response is given um, to an incident, mental health or fire, or EMS or police, instead of it defaulting sort of to police and then everybody else following. So that's our decoupling. And then the third fund, so 20 million immediately reallocated, 80 million of functions being made independent, and then 50 million is our reimagining fund, which is basically things we marked for review and continued community conversation. Because people in the community recognize that we all need to come together and work on changing this system over the course of, of years, um, because you don't just like fix one of the biggest parts of the local government in one budget cycle. So we were 
asking ourselves, why does the city have so many horses? Um, do we need so many horses um, in our policing? Because we've seen how that can sometimes be abused. We, don't, we didn't decide to get rid of the horses tomorrow, but said, let's evaluate how much it really costs us to maintain all these stables and have all of the horses uh, in the police department. Might there be better ways to keep people safe um, for the same amount of money? There's so much police overtime getting spent in the city, and a lot of that overtime goes to chasing down false burglar alarms or responding to mental health calls. Maybe if we find ways to stop chasing all those burglar alarms or stop doing pretext traffic stops, um, to stop sending lots and lots of police officers in riot gear to a protest, which inevitably heightens tensions and makes it more dangerous for everyone, aren't there savings we can find there? So this $50 million fund actually didn't change anything, but it labeled what it is that we want to work on in the future. And so that 20 plus that 80 plus the 50 we want to work on created this $150 million headline um, that is so being talked about right now. But really, I think actually lays out what it's like a thoughtful, longer term process in our city to get away from policing being our primary response to problems to it just being one thing we have, apart from lots of other ways that we can address an issue. Somebody recently described it as local government um, having like a whole potential tool belt, but just using a hammer for everything. And that just doesn't make sense. So, so that, is, that is that on policing. Uh, and then this last one on inclusion and, and power. Um, we, uh, you know, I, we have to recognize that um, it tends to be those of us with more power, who own homes, um, with more access to resources, um, whether it's, I mean, in this case, I'm not even just talking about big corporate power, I'm just talking about amongst everyday people getting involved, it's way less often that members of our immigrant community, um, working class people, uh, renters are, are so often not the people driving the conversation themselves. So we tried to refashion functions within our local government to make it more inclusive. Uh, one uh, great example of that I see, I see Dr. Shearer here, and I know Dr. Uh, Mueller was here a little bit earlier, I see Sarah Wu is here. Folks uh, at UT came together with, with us to come up with a community planning process for a 20 acre uh, piece of land in the St. John neighborhood, which is a historically black community here in Austin that's overwhelmingly working class. Oh, and then I saw that Dr. Adigan is here too, who really supported us in this. And the goal was for us to actually really ask people what they wanted to see on that piece of property. The city had previously said we wanted to put a criminal justice complex there. It became really obvious when you asked folks that nobody wanted that there. But the question is, what do you want? And not just what do you want in a dream scenario, well, let's actually give people the real tools, the real financial information, the real city planning uh, documents around if you really had full information and we really treated you with the respect um, that you deserve to really make this choice, what kinds of choices would you make? And so we spent hours and hours um, putting together uh, presentations and bringing people together to say, look, you can't put housing and childcare along the highway but you can put it in this part of the property. Look, it's really expensive for housing to be built uh, for everybody that could, for sale at $100,000, but you can have some rental units that are lower cost. You can have some home ownership units that might cost a little bit more than that, but then you might need some market rate housing to be able to balance out the cost. What do you think? And people really came together and put a vision together. And now those members of the community are not only driving that project, but they're driving so many other conversations. They're driving... Um, how, it is, you know, how it is that we should hand out masks and PPE to people during COVID-19. They're uh, rising up to, to sit on city commissions to talk about how it is we use our limited housing dollars. They're getting involved in the conversation about Project Connect and anti-displacement as part of that project. And so really bringing people in to planning one really important project in their neighborhood gives people more access and sort of a, a sense of how City Hall could work to be able to go work on other things. We did that with a fair chance hiring ordinance. We decided to pass an ordinance that said, let's get rid of the question on job applications that says, do you have a criminal background? So that people aren't being excluded um, from the jump and that people actually have a chance at an interview before their background check is run. And that's a really important policy that we passed. But the most important thing we did with that policy was have formerly incarcerated folks and their family members themselves write that policy, advocate for it, go and lobby, our members of our economic development committee to pass that. And those same folks that helped pass that ordinance actually then learned about the state capital because they tried to 
pass a law at the state capitol saying you're not allowed to have a law like this, Austin. And they went and actually then figured out how the state capitol worked and managed to block that state capitol law that would have undone their victory. They then now are advocating at Travis County to prevent the construction and expansion of a women's jail there. So again, there are these different ways where we can actually do our policy work in a way that brings in folks that are normally excluded and the fruits of that go far beyond the immediate project. Um, the, the last one I'll mention is that we also have to think about ways that we can fund and build organizations that do that work themselves. So um, for example, the code enforcement department was gonna beef up their marketing budget to just sort of put out more ads about, hey, if your landlord is treating you poorly, call 311. And instead we took that money and gave it to legal services organizations to have tenants form their own tenants associations for they themselves to sort of prioritize what landlord issues were important to them. And it birthed an entire organization called BASTA Building and Strengthening Tenant Action, basically saying instead of spending a bunch of money on ads, we can actually spend money on, on giving people the, the staffing and the expertise to do some of this advocacy and enforcement themselves. And I believe we need to be doing the same things in the labor movement and, and, and beyond. So there's lots of other areas where we could do, be doing more inclusion, you know, on the labor and wages front, in environmental justice, all of that. But I felt like these four topics would take up 45 minutes, and they did. So I'm done talking uh, at you and ready to answer whatever questions you might have. Thank you guys for, for tuning in. Uh, thanks a lot, Greg. That was a, that was a terrific uh, and really comprehensive overview. So let me open up to questions. Um, you can just unmute and ask a question. You can put a question in the question box and uh, my collaborator, Brittany, will uh, handle that. So uh, questions for Councilmember Kassar. I would love to ask a question. Thank you so much, Greg. It was great to hear you talk. Um, I would love to see if you could say more about the anti-displacement efforts that are um, expected to be wrapped into Prop A. I've had a tough time finding out what those are, so I would love if you could provide a little bit of color there and explain how you respond um, to folks. I was reading my um, um, community impact and I saw this giant ad saying that Prop A would increase property taxes by 25% and I was like, okay, there's not a lot of clarity on this. So yeah, how do you talk to people about um, the anti-displacement efforts in Prop A? Yeah, I saw that ad too, and it says, basically seems to imply we're gonna build a big coal engine train too, right? Is that the one that has like the old, like the train from the 1800s on it? Yeah, the money um, train. <laughs> yeah, there's, there's only, you know, there's only so much you can do uh, with, um, with intentionally or vaguely misinformation information stuff. But the fact of the matter is, it does cost a lot of money to build an entire comprehensive mass transit system and run it. Um, and so it is $7 billion uh, and it is, and it does increase taxes. The fact of the matter is it's about a 4% property tax increase. Um, and so, and that's not a small thing. Now, of course, the ads all say, the anti ads all say a 25% property tax increase because the city portion of your tax bill is pretty small. And so if you take 25% of the city portion, then, you, then it is 4%, right? And so they, they always find a way to, to make it. And, you know, and I, as a proponent, will always find ways to talk about it well, try to be accurate. Uh, I think sometimes opponents, you know, will talk about it in the way that seems most extreme. But it is real. The way I try to talk about it is to be really transparent with people what the cost is for their home. And so for your average District 4 homeowner, whose home is usually valued a little bit less than the average Austin homeowner, it's like, a, it's like 55 or 60 cents a day, um, you know, which comes out to you know, somewhere around whatever it might be, 18, 19, 20 bucks a month. That's real money, right? Because everybody would like an extra 20 bucks a month for a, a, all the things that we all need. But when you compare that to the cost of car ownership, uh, you know, car ownership costs everyone thousands of dollars a year. And we have to be able to get to a city where you know a family doesn't need two cars or in some cases three cars to be able to get around and to be able to make it here so ultimately on the affordability front i think it's really important for us to figure out to to, to show and explain that the fact of the matter is car ownership and the status quo isn't free uh there there isn't an election and nobody ever talks about the tax impact of building big highways right uh which 
you know, they're continuing a multi-billion dollar expansion of I-35, which all does also cost us money uh, while increasing, you know, uh, while making climate change, you know, increasing carbon emissions and all the like. So it's really hard. And so I think in the end, it, we ultimately have to, in my view, accept that uh, that change is difficult. You know, if, if electric transportation and public transportation and these things were easy, then it would already happen and there wouldn't have to be a ballot item and those sorts of things. So it is, it is hard and I think it involves that kind of real conversation with the person. Um, the anti-displacement dollars though, policy-wise, um, are being spent primarily in the areas around those lines. And there aren't actually, isn't actually a really developed set of exactly how that money is going to be spent because what we actually committed to was working with those communities on what strategy matters to them. And so in an area where you have a lot of precarious home ownership, we might be doing more sort of uh, projects to help people stay in those homes. In parts of my district, you actually just have like lots of large affordable housing complexes, some of whom are actually required to stay your low rent because they're subsidized, but maybe that requirement is gonna fade in 10 years. So maybe we bring some of that money in to negotiate with those landlords to extend it to another 40 years. So there's just a variety of things. In some cases, we might be buying a public storage facility and a gas station to put a new train stop there. And we might use those dollars to build ex uh, new affordable housing, both home ownership and rental around the station. And create a preference for people living in the neighborhood to be able to relocate there if it ever becomes unaffordable. So there's different strategies we can use with that $300 million. And our commitment is it will only be used for lower income people. And we're going to develop it alongside the needs of those low income people in impacted areas. And that's the, that's the legally required commitment. Um, because again, some of these rail lines may not even be up and operational for several years to come. So it's kind of like we're kind of planning on dealing with what, whatever the neighborhood specific issue might be. That's useful. Other questions? I'll ask a question. Hi, Greg. Um, thanks so much for your talk. Um, so I'm one thing that I've been thinking about a lot in terms of both Prop A and the anti-displacement funds and the follow-up to Uprooted and what we learned through St. John's is so much of what we want to do is work with neighborhoods or work with specific communities and help them to come up with strategies or identify the priorities that really are going to make the difference for them uh, and you know, be more sensitive to the particular populations and needs in that community. And I, I really feel like we need to think more um, intentionally about how we build capacity or how we help communities be able to do that and how we run community planning processes, which we really don't have much capacity within the city's planning department to do. And I know that neighborhood housing has now started to put out um, RFPs for capacity building grants that are you know $50,000 or so but I'm not sure there's a kind of clear um, strategic agenda attached to that. You know, there, I, I think it's pretty um, broad, the language in the RFP, and it, it just seems like a moment where so many of the things we're saying we wanna do will really be based in those kind of processes, and we haven't really thought about how to, how to help build the capacity to do that, both within the city and within communities. I just wanted to throw that out there as maybe a possible future <laughs> topic of yeah, collaboration. No, it, it, but I, I, to me, it seems like really a foundational piece. Right. We are, we are really short on capacity building, um, and especially capacity building of those voices that are not just interested in the politics of the thing, but are interested in getting the thing done for their, for their area. Um, and so that, that's a real challenge. And what I'll say is basically each of the examples that I provided on places where we are doing it in a way that I think is really right, it takes a lot of time and attention and, and a lot of time in, in each of these cases, time and attention from a council office of which there's very few of us. And I, I think it, it, it really asks this question about strategy and how local governments can like imbue the idea of strategy and what it is they do. Because right now, like I think everybody, you know, people, you know, city departments can just be kind of 
you know, conflict averse and say, hey, there's some money for capacity building and I'm not really going to be too directive about it because we could get in trouble. And, you know, there's going to be a really interesting conversation between here and May of whether or not we politicize the bureaucracy more by having a stronger mayor form of government. I don't have a position on that yet, but it's a really interesting question. We have a really depoliticized uh, city government right now in lots of ways, right? Where they're not like, you know, driving a specific agenda very much. You know, there's a lot, you see a lot in the news um, when there is one. Um, and, but my assessment is on the whole, like the 13,000 employees working for the city are generally just kind of, uh, are, are, are pretty f free from like a really strategic political influence. And that's a really hard balance to strike in any city because you can go overboard, right? Where, where it's all driven by like a really specific strategic agenda. And I know what you're saying is not that we can, we can, I mean, ideally we can maybe capacity build in those communities without that. But I'm, but I think there's just a really interesting question there of like, what does it take to have more of a strategic agenda on a given topic? One answer is, is what we've learned here. If a council office and community members and stakeholders really get involved, you can do that. You can, but how can, but how can this just be happening more naturally across the city so you don't have to have so much attention to make something strategic? It's something I've been thinking a lot about. But, but based on your real question, I do think that probably we should be telling the housing department that with these capacity building grants, let's be thinking about how the big pots of money, and if there's gonna be 300 million housing anti-displacement dollars, they should be focusing on that. Thanks. Um, I think Dean Addington had a question. Um, yeah, first of all, Greg, thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule to come here and talk to us today. It, it couldn't have been clearer and more helpful uh, for me and I, I'm sure for many others uh, here to have a, a better picture and a better window into what, what's happening uh, in, in City Council on these really, really important issues. My question relates to an event I attended about a year ago. I'm, I'm trying to get my timing right. I know, I know people were together, so it was certainly before March. Uh, and I don't know if you were there. It was between the mayor's office, uh, the, uh, uh, the Downtown Alliance. I know a number of the, the city council members were there. Alan, I think, might have been there. I'm not sure if he was or wasn't, but um, they, they were talking very much about the future economic development of Austin. And I left with um, a, a, a rather sobering picture of how it was being framed and that the anticipated development uh, was moving toward and what they expected that and, and again someone who was there correct me if I have have this percentage wrong uh, the expectation is that the uh, person moving to Austin will be um, uh, white male in their 30s that they thought about 65 percent would be of that ilk uh, basically because of the tech industry they said there would still be jobs for women because health care that surely some healthcare jobs uh, would show up for women. And then of course the inevitable service jobs to serve the tech bros and, and those women working in healthcare. Uh, you know, this kind of uh, stratification, uh, you know, it's, and it's an economic stratification. Uh, it's also a demographic and social stratification that you have with it. And it's gonna be an educational stratification in, in many kind of ways is, is sort of driving many of the decisions, many of the activities taking place in the city. And I'm wondering as we start to think about whether it's affordable housing or, or the, the public transit thing, whether that's on the long end of a set of drivers uh, and it's, it's trying to sort of like mitigate or respond to things that are not only have happened, but are gonna even more aggressively happen in the future. How does that play into your planning and, and the conversations that you all are having? So I wasn't at that event, but I'm not surprised to, to hear that. Um, and, and if you're asking in some ways, are, are, is everything I'm talking about like just kind of swimming upstream at a stream that maybe is going faster than we can swim? Uh, I, I, I do feel like we're swimming upstream. I don't know whether 
it will work or not, you know? Um, uh, and, and definitely there are forces uh, at play that are certainly way stronger than anything that any one uh, office can do, or even potentially even what just city government itself can do. And so I think in part, uh, part of what we have to be doing is, is, is setting what we, what we ideally want and how to get as many people organized around those ideas as we can. And maybe we're swimming upstream and we swim faster than the stream and maybe not. But I guess my honest answer to you is like, you know, is to paddle and get other people to paddle. And then after a few years, look up and see how we did. Uh, because I, ju I just don't know any other way to do that, to do it. Um, uh, what I will say, of course, is that we do see, you know, a lot of, we do see a lot, you know, continue to see a lot of Latino growth in the city um, and are starting to see while African-Americans are reducing in proportion, sort of a bounce back of, of, of growth of, of in the African-American community. And I think those things are good things. Um, I do think that the, to get, I do think that within, and I, I haven't solved this part, have no really not a good idea on how to address this yet though there is a sense especially amongst a lot of younger folks of color that um that culturally it's becoming a less friendly city i mean it's a majority still a city majority of people of color um but people don't always talk about austin that way i think a lot of times it is you know what it is that we hold up and what what it is that we recognize about the city that makes it feel a certain way we have a lot of segregation in our city too. I think the way our urban landscape is set up, you know, if Houston is also very segregated, but it feels segregated in a different way, like between driving between here and there, you're drive, driving through a segregated slices of pies and suddenly all the street signs are in Vietnamese and then you're in a Latino neighborhood and then you're in a black neighborhood. They're segregated, but you seem to go through it maybe more than here. I don't know that maybe that's just really anecdotal. And, and I'm really interested in people's thoughts, but there's a apart from the clear economic stratification issues, there is also this cultural component where it has to feel, where it's important for people to feel welcome and friendly. On the, um, I just got handed a book on our, on sort of planning around gender equity issues as well that I'm really excited to read. I forget the title, but you got somebody in the chat might tell me, hey, is it this book, this book, or this book? But I do think that, um, I, I do think that especially in our city council, which is what became majority women for the first time, uh, in 2015, and has remained so, that those, that, that stuff is also hopefully in some way shifting. Um, but I, I really, um, I guess I don't have a great answer to your, to your question other than there has to be a vision for something different. We have to organize some level of political power around that idea of something different, and then try as hard as we can to be smart while we do it. Uh, oh, and then John Michael just sent us the demographic trends, trends bubble here. Um, the, the other piece that maybe I'll add to this is, you know, on the other side of COVID, there is a chance that we become even more unequal and worse. It's kind of that K-shaped recovery thing that keeps being brought up. Um, and I think that we are still, we've been in such disaster response mode that none of us have quite caught our breath around how is it that, what tools do we have available as a local government to make it a more equitable um, recovery as part of our small business uh, disaster grants that we authorized yesterday. We're talking about making sure that there's like actually a committed process for any business that gets saved to like meet and sit down with their workers, be that music workers from a music venue being saved or restaurant workers um, from a restaurant being saved to like figure out how it is that we have a stronger and more equitable industry on the other side, because it's not like things were perfect pre pandemic. Um, so how do we get to more cooperatives and to, and to better working conditions on the other side of it, I think is really important because if we're gonna have a lot of service industry jobs, those don't necessarily have to be bad jobs, right? Being a custodian or being a hotel housekeeper doesn't have to be a low wage job where sexual harassment is part of the job. Like those don't have to be tipped industries. Um, those can be more middle-class industries, um, but I think it takes a level of, uh, uh, of shift in what it is that we expect in the city. So I think that's part of it too. Other questions? I have 
have one. Please go ahead. Thank you. Thanks for being here, council member. So uh, I know that you've worked really hard for years about over land use reform and trying to get more of a, a land use code that allows for different types of housing. It seems so I work in affordable housing, my daytime job, and we're watching the median family income skyrocket, you know, just mainly because of displacement. We're, we're only allowing about a fourth of our growth to occur within Austin. And we still have this, all these, these exclusionary zoning policies just kind of making it to where we can only build the most expensive product available to the top 20% of income earners in a growing and growing amount of Austin's land. And so what, what happens there and how do we figure out a way to be more of an inclusive city that allows the bedrock of the community to stay here instead of pushing them all out? Yeah, and so that's something that I was trying to touch on sort of at the, at the top of the talk. Um, uh, it would be an extraordinary effort to get it from that one fourth of regional uh, growth to be inside the city to just even get it to a third, um, especially, and it gets harder and harder every year. So part of what we are uh, battling actually in court is what is how and, and um, what, through what process is it even legal for the city to update you know, 30 years worth of, of old rules to be able to get to a place where a little house when it's scraped can get replaced by, you know, three or four um, row homes attached to each other rather than just one really big house that's the same size as all four of those. Um, we are trying to do it in a, in a thoughtful and equitable way um, by saying, you know what, in areas that aren't as susceptible to gentrification on that map, we should be encouraging more of that. And in places that are more susceptible, it, can be a, it should be slower, recognizing we need new housing everywhere but that not everybody's starting off on the exact same page. And that's been a really sort of appreciated and different way of doing this than other cities. But inevitably, if, uh, as I mentioned, if we, if, we are, if we have only this much housing capacity left and we have this much growth coming, then that's just going to fuel, um, again, if that's going to fuel displacement. We're trying to find ways to, to, um, to, to address it, but yeah, it is a really, really hotly um, politically driven issue. Sometimes even things that you wish weren't. So, you know, in 2016, uh, I led on trying to fix our granny flat rules. So up until 2016 on lots of everyday lots in the middle of the city, you could add 600 square feet to your house. But if it wasn't attached to your house and it had a kitchen, it was illegal. Um, you know, it's those sorts of things where we had a disincentive to that smaller um, housing type that might have more people fit into a neighborhood. Um, and, you know, of course that can be, that can be hard and, and, you know, it is, it is hard for, for anybody to sometimes to, to feel things changing all around you. Um, but the choice is kind of what kind of change do we want? You know, you might wind up having a few more trash cans on the street and more cars parked in the street, um, which can, you know, be inconvenient for sure. Um, but then there's, but if we don't do that, then there might be the change of the little house getting scraped and a really big, you know, expensive thing getting built there instead. And so we're in a place of constant change and we're trying to, to guide it to be the better kind of the people that might be better. Additional questions? I have, I have a question. Uh, my question, uh, um, the councilman mentioned uh, a few moments ago about sort of the sort of the bump back in the African American population here in Austin, and I have a question about sort of what obligation does the city have to, to in all this sort of you know growth and all this sort of people moving here, these tech bros or whoever are moving here, what obligation does the city have to address sort of the marketing of the city? or the cultural aspects of the city that don't seem welcoming to African Americans to increase increase the uh, uh, perception of Austin. I, I work for a nonprofit and I can recall um, a couple years ago uh, trying to recruit for a pretty attractive position here and being told by some African American applicants um, why they didn't want to come to Austin. And it was a range of issues uh, from uh, one, one, one fellow joking and said, you know, I'm not going to come to to Austin and stand in line for barbecue when I can get barbecue on any corner in the city I'm in now, or, or other issues like that. So I, I just wonder what kind of obligation does the city have to kind of address those cultural issues? I mean, I've been here for you know quite some time and, and I feel like the biggest battle I have is sort of um, wanting to leave 
um, um, uh, despite of you know having a being a really good good job and having a really uh, a good sort of uh, network of friends and associates, but not really that sort of African American community that I you know that that I you know am used to from uh, other places I've lived. Sure, I mean I think we have a, a huge responsibility to that. It's a huge problem. Uh, I mean by percentage we we used to have a much higher percentage black population here. Um, I think from the marketing perspective, in some ways it's like we should support those organizations, those black organizations that want to um, send a, a positive message about why it is that they are proud of the city. Um, but I'm always hesitant to say that the city should come up and say that we're like a really friendly place for black folks when, when frankly, there's still so many institutional issues and problems that it, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't be accurate or right for the city government to say that. I think on the city government side, we should be supporting those organizations that want to send the, the, whatever message they want to send. And then two, we should like actually go and fix and address the problems that people bring up, um, be it um, issues of you know, wh whatever the broad spectrum of issues might be, be it issues, issues of equal access to jobs, the issues in policing and criminal justice that I, uh, that I talked about, or just kind of equity in our programs generally. Um, so, I, you know, I'm kind of like trying to focus on like, well, we should do the affordable housing. We should create uh, programs for people to come back to the city that are affordable. We should, you know, like do some real stuff about police violence and mass incarceration uh, and the kinds of things that, that are being raised so that people then can actually say that the city is trying. Um, on the cultural stuff, though, it is hard, right? Um, we are finally making some real investments in things like the Carver Museum and, the, and, and our African American um, Heritage District. I think that what we're doing in St. John, um, sort of showing what it would look like to like really reinvest in respect to historic African American neighborhood, can hopefully help like rebuild some community and trust. And the, I think the last point is also like we do have some, still some like really great young black musicians uh, doing amazing things here. Yeah, great uh, black artists doing amazing things here, but we don't always elevate that work, right? Like nothing against, and I like quite a bit, both like Matthew McConaughey and Willie Nelson, but like, why is that? Like, why is that Austin? Um, when we like have Gary Clark Jr. and Jackie Benson, like, you know, why? Um, and, I, and I don't have an answer to that question. I'm just like, not a, you know, I came from like immigrants and labor organizing and I'm learning all this other stuff and I haven't learned that the answer to this other thing yet. Uh, on culture, but there's got to be something to it. And I think in part, maybe that's pushing some of our big institutions like ACL and South by Southwest to elevate, to elevate that work. Because it's not, there's certainly fewer black folks here by percentage than Houston and some other places, but there are like real, there are some real hubs of black community, but I just think oftentimes it's also not like respected and uplifted the way it should be. I don't know if that's helpful. I mean, yeah, it is helpful. I guess the only um, thing I'll say is uh, you mentioned that uh, it'd be hard for the city to send that message when we haven't sort of addressed sort of some of the challenges and issues we have uh, regarding, uh, 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 we haven't put not, we haven't put not, we haven't got our act together. I mean, if we're going to wait for that to happen, I mean, there's a lot of cities that fall under that, that rubric, so I don't know that's if that's... Right. Yeah. You might be right. No, I just, and so maybe at some point it makes sense to send the message anyways. It's just how do you make sure that you're not engaging in hypocrisy while you're trying to do a good thing. That's the hard, it's, and, and, and so it's a hard question. I can just add a comment about capacity building and a question. Um, I, was, I was a City of Boston employee, but now have moved to Oklahoma City, and um, just interested in seeing what's going on and worked on the code writing team, now working on a code writing team here. Um, but the thing that's resonated with me in this national election is the thing about um, this equity training for the federal employees. And um, before I left, we did, the equity office um, did a very intensive uh, training for, for the people on the code writing team and other, some other people in, in the city. And it was a life-changing experience for me. And um, also it was allowed at least me to meet people in the community that I would never have met, you know, before. And so I hope that 
that continues and that's a uh, they, they almost mentioned in the debate the other night i wanted i wanted someone to explain what that meant you know because it really was a life-changing experience and so um i don't know how much that cost or i think they brought in two groups one from new orleans one from seattle um but it it, it really broadened my perspective as a planner too so. i'm really glad to hear that thank you for sharing that good luck fixing stuff over in oklahoma too <laughs> all right sorry i've lost you i had a question um, hi, Greg. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, my question for you is, how is the city's role as the state capital intersect with your plans? Like, does it affect it? Do you have to consider that? Every day. <laughs> <laughs> and how? Like, yeah, I don't know. I mean, right, the governor lives here. State legislators come in and out of here uh, all the time. And so we would just have that extra added attention. Um, and so there's a lot of different ways that it intersects. I mean, we, we have to negotiate with the state because they want to pay different electric, electric rates. You know, we have to interact with the, with the states because, you know, they're expanding the, the northern part of the state capital uh, onto our property. And how do you negotiate and deal with that? To the, to the point where also the governor is, um, you know, held a press conference about the police budget that I just showed you. He didn't go into nearly the level of detail, but he got up in the morning, woke up in Austin, drove to Tarrant County in Fort Worth and held a press conference about Austin's budget out in Fort Worth um, in order to sort of drum up some attention to it, I think I, I expect for elections out there. So it's an everyday, it's an everyday thing. There are some really, I mean, there is of course tons of amazing and great things about it. Um, um, you know, the, I think in many ways our city has a more egalitarian bent because we have a lot of state employees in our city and a lot of good government jobs. Um, and that's a really good thing. And I'm, I'm proud of that. Um, I think, you know, we, we have a lot of our beauty, you know, how, how, do you, how can you beat, you know, Congress Avenue and that kind of stuff. Um, but it does bring all of this extra attention. It also takes a lot of property off the tax roll, um, which is a really interesting dynamic, right? Like you have a lot of jobs um, and a lot of property that don't, um, that don't pay into property tax, which is our primary way of funding local government in Texas. So it's really, it, it, it has tons of pros, um, but the cons are really strongly felt. Um, you know, we, it, it's not just things like sanctuary cities or police reform that get um, state attention. It's things as small as um, how much we pay on a contract to pay to clean toilets downtown for people experiencing homelessness. It's it's the plastic bag single use ban um, that just really grabs the attention of because state reps, some of them spend more time here than they do back in their home district. So it's um, so so yeah, we we feel it a lot. I don't know if that's what you were going for as far as yeah yeah. Mind. Thank you. That helped a lot. Thanks. Other questions for Greg? Well, thank you guys, unless there was somebody else. Uh, yeah, I'm trying to look at the, um, well, if nobody's gonna jump in right now, I'll ask a question. Um, you know, as you mentioned, um, an important element um, of trying to at least mitigate, if not, you know, solve the housing problem is changing the land development code. And you, you admitted that uh, it was, it's been a seven year process and, so I guess my question is, is like after the election, um, what what do you think the prospects are to kind of revisit and actually pass a new land development code? Yeah, so right now we are, we are held up in court with this really broad and far reaching opinion that makes it really, really hard for almost any city um, uh, to, pa to, to implement and pass a new land development code comprehensively, period. Um, and without getting too deep into the details, um, essentially the, the rules associated with changing the zoning of one property um, um, are, by this judicial opinion, which we're appealing, are trying to be applied to every single property in the city. And that makes it really, really, really hard to, to, to change almost anything. So the answer to your question, I think, is the Court of Appeals 
could rule to say, you know what, cities with a majority vote can just change their land development code as they have done across the state. And at which point then, um, um, I think we will restart back where we left off pre-pandemic um, and hopefully keep editing a final draft in a way to, I think, probably better advance a few goals that weren't quite met yet, which are like, how do we do future planning even once we've passed the land development code? How do we uh, better get more income restricted housing out of the code and dial up some of the environmental requirements? I think that that's kind of where we were still uh, hanging back in March. Or the Court of Appeals could rule some clarify how it is that we pass a land development code if the way that cities across the state have been doing it is wrong. Um, and then we'll just have to play by those rules and come up with something better based on whatever those rules are. But unfortunately, where we're kind of stuck right now is that it's like really unclear how any city could ever do it. Um, and so we're, we're largely unable to do almost anything, including even the granny flat rules that I described to you where we said, okay, if you could build it as an extension to your house, you could build it as a granny flat, like smaller things that maybe we could have consensus on. This ruling seems to almost block our ability to even do that um, in a way that, so, so it's really, really tricky. Um, basically, we're, yeah, we're just kind of all tied up in knots right now over some of the judicial stuff, if that makes sense. Yeah. It was a um, stunning ruling. <laughs> Uh, we have a question in the chat for you, Councilman. I see that. Um, so, th yeah, so what long-term effects do we see uh, if we add the rapid transit? Um, it is, I mean, I, I decided to, I voted to put it on the ballot, so I think that overall the good vastly overwhelms the, the bad. The good effects, you know, are that hopefully we'll be able to have, like other big cities, mass transit as a real viable option so that you know, they'll be, we'll have a lot more families that only have to buy and own one car, or families that can have zero cars. Um, I think huge mental health benefits of not having to sit in traffic in rush hour as your only option to get somewhere. Big environmental benefit because our two biggest um, uh, emitters of carbon in the city, 90% of the carbon we emit in the city is either electric generation or transportation. On the electric generation front, we are now uh, the number one utility in the country as far as going from dirty energy to clean energy. Nobody else, uh, because we have a democratically run and governed publicly owned electric utility, we've gone from 37% uh, not a renewable to 61% renewable from 2017 to 2021. Uh, no other utility in the country can match that. And my hope is that we stay on our path to become actually you know, fully carbon neutral as we shut down a, a gas plant and a, and a coal plant uh, coming up. And so huge advancements there. On the transportation front, we are not advancing even close to that fast. So the, the electrification and, and mass transit part is critical there. Um, and then obviously there's the whole getting around the city access, just basic public transit stuff, um, where I think it'll just be more inclusive and affordable for more people that need it. As far as bad effects though, I mean, it is, it, I would be lying to you if, it was, if I was to tell you it's gonna be easy to ret retrofit a mass transit system into such a built out city. I mean, you're gonna have, they're gonna be swinging hammers for a while. They're gonna be tearing up streets. They're gonna be pulling up lines that are you know, buried in the ground. That's gonna be really hard and really inconvenient and expensive. But of course, if we just keep kicking the can down the road, it's only gonna get more expensive and more inconvenient um, as you have twice as many cars come onto the road in the next 20 years without any and without any real ability to expand even roads. So that's going to be really inconvenient. It's going to be expensive. Um, and, and there will be, you know, increased demand to live near those stops and lines, which is why we're going to try to invest as much of our city money to keep those areas mixed income around the lines, because without uh, government intervention, then you could expect, given our current um, given our current growth trajectory for you to get like wealthier and more exclusive enclaves around those transit stops. And, and that's part of why we are like trying to really aggressively plan around those, around those stops. Okay. Maybe one more question. I 
it's okay if there isn't one. We're close to the end. Yeah, we are. Okay, well, perhaps um, perhaps we should let you go, Greg. Uh, again, thanks so much. Um, it was really terrific um, and uh, extremely helpful, I think, uh, as we go um, into the electoral process. And um, I'm sure everyone uh, on the list of participants is going to vote. Um, so uh, thanks again. Uh, and thanks everyone for attending. Thank you guys. Really appreciate it. Bye. Bye.